Hello, my name is James Virtus Soto. I'm a movie poster artist. I've been designing posters for over 30 years. Today, we're gonna compare original posters to their remakes. Let's take a look at Ocean's Eleven. So in this case, you have this kind of hand-tinted style from the 50s. These little running icons with the environment is very much from the 50s pulp novel universe. Uh, the names are very prominently featured and the logo has this very 50s graphic design aesthetic. Let's take a look at the remake. I designed this poster. Our company chose this direction because we knew that the director wanted us to stay within this 50s aesthetic. Let's take a look at the Vertigo poster. This poster was designed by Saul Bass. He's the most copied graphic designer in movie poster art. And we were inspired by this aesthetic. These octagons here kind of are very reminiscent of the spiral in the background, the black and white running icon, reminiscent of the walking grouping that we have here. Again, the, the font itself has a very 50s aesthetic. Here it's more hand-drawn. We kind of tended more modern and contemporary. Also the use of negative spaces in the same arena. This 1950s aesthetic, which comes from a Saul Bass school of graphic design, utilizes the black and white, high contrast imagery, the different color, flat color shapes used throughout these puzzle pieces that almost form this narrative being created using graphic design. Let's look at Saul Bass's poster for the man with the golden arm. As you can see, the color palettes are very similar. You have this hand-drawn type. There's a font called a Saul Bass font now that incorporates this 50s jagged type movement. You also have these panels, which are creating a border that's central to the logo and using the language of graphic design to sell a story. What you can see here is this dagger that's the main element of the poster. These very hard angular shapes and broken down deconstruction of the dagger is very similar to these puzzle pieces. The use of negative space is very much from the Saul Bass School of Design. Let's look at one more Saul Bass design for Anatomy of a Murder. The typography here is integrated, which is kind of a signature of Saul Bass. This actually could be in a museum. I'm not sure if this could be in, in a museum, but the same graphic design aesthetic is utilized. I think because the actors are featured, it becomes more of an advertisement than a piece of art. You can tell this movie came out more recently because of the font and the typography. It has a very commercial cell. Usually when the stars aren't big enough to carry the whole film, they start introducing a story element or trying to create some artful interpretation of the story. In this case, the fragmented dagger creates a psychological narrative that's occurring. This is the original 1937 release poster. The one thing that really captures that era is this curved type. This curved angle here creates a stage for these characters to emerge from. This golden light and the use of illustration and this hand-drawn quality gives these human emotional characteristics to the story. You really have this embrace of the two characters and it tells a love story front and center. This 1954 version incorporates the element of collage. That was collage and having your star front and center is very much from that era. Uh, Judy Garland was a huge star at the time. From a marketing perspective, the experience of musicals and singing and dancing as a promise of entertainment seems to have dominated the cell compared to the previous one that featured the love story. Here you're selling this kind of technicolor world of multiple storylines and multiple elements that take this to a new perspective. What you can see here is this typography from the 70s which is reminiscent of that era with the borders and the diagonal type. Also, the photography in this is very glamorous, provocative moment, which feels like a fashion ad, a new way of selling your stars front and center. Here you have another element that's very 
prevalent in 70s movie poster advertising, which is a secondary story cell. You also have this water device that connects to the logo, which is very much a 70s aesthetic. Also the gradients of color against this posterized photo effect. Let's take a look at a couple of fashion photos from the 70s. The lighting, this very dramatic black and white contrasty photography that's shown here. It's a new way of showing celebrities on a poster. The sexy approach is something that was a big trend in the 70s. Here again, you have incorporated the black and white fashion aesthetic in the photography, the very human connection between the two characters, which draws you into the poster. The use of negative space, which allows your eye to go to the center of the poster. The main aspect of this poster is the star cell engaged in this human moment. Lady Gaga is featured more prominently than Bradley Cooper, but their connection is very much the main draw of this poster. And they are two parts of an equal partnership. Let's compare this to Walk the Line. There's the guitar, which is an obvious connection. It's a very intimate moment. They both promise a musical romance. In A Star is Born, the use of gold brings it into the Oscar Academy stratosphere. This is a Japanese poster for Godzilla. This is a kaiju movie. Many movie titles released at this time were about science experiments gone wrong. What stands out most for me here is the use of the photography. There's no clear perspective being utilized. It's just a collage of multiple characters, these effects coming out of the Godzilla's mouth are very minimal and downplayed, but it works. You also have a very fake looking monster. It portrays this campy underground pop aesthetic. Here you can see this suggestion of the creature. The scale is portrayed by the smaller scale of the secondary element. This is a promise of like a major special effects experience. And the copy line promises that, and also the, uh, the typography has that very Hollywood action aesthetic. This is reminiscent of disaster films from the late 90s. The scale of the poster is very dramatic in all three cases. If you notice, the copy line is prominent, similar to Godzilla. There's a sense of less is more, where you're showing less, but you're evoking a big epic disaster and this foreboding nature of something big coming. You have this grand scale perspective and minimalism that I think resonates in, in these three posters in a similar way that Godzilla does. What's interesting about this off the bat is the use of the kanji that brings it into that underground Japanese pop culture, the environment, these missiles coming down from the sky hitting the character, has a promise of action, the fire brewing behind the landscape. The fact that the, the character is walking away is drawing the viewer in. The campaign for this release also incorporated fan art, which is an example of how a studio release is able to speak to a wide audience, but also stay connected to the fan base. If we look at all three Godzilla posters side by side, if you can see how this original release has influenced a lot of the fan art. This one has brought in the Hollywood perspective in the grand scale of action films from Hollywood. And this one has a more of a quiet, understated quality to it. This cult exploitation design is captured very powerfully here. The white border is reminiscent of the 70s. You have like the scream, which is the horror genre, meets the kind of the cult quality of, just of the logo. The use of black and this kind of exaggerated copy cell is very much from that era. Let's compare this to some cult releases from that era, this exploitation copy cell seems to be a driving force in all of these posters. All these three posters have that 70s border aesthetic, framing this as a non-studio horror release. If you look at the typography here, it's kind of a throwback quality to it. The exaggerated blood splatters 
come from that exploitation era. It also the female character used in an exploitive manner. You also have this unusual language of storytelling here that's not commercial at all, that goes back to the cult retro quality that you would not find in most traditional advertising in this day and age, and has the artistic qualities that most uh, Polish posters have. If you look at the Polish poster for eight and a half, you have the hand-drawn typography, which is very much from the school of Polish poster advertising. The use of black and white line art here with the eyes of most Polish posters, even up to today, are portrayed in illustration style. And also the idea of one world within the other. You have the silhouette and you have this illustration displaying a story. Here you have the silhouette of the blood and then you have the illustration displaying the story. Both of these posters emphasize expression over advertising.